just give them a good show. You never know who will be in the audience. Those words are sounding inside me as I stare uncomfortably at the doe-eyed woman I have been conversing with. A petite five-foot nothing, she is charmingly pretty and starting to tear up as she struggles to express herself. Unfortunately, everything has grown awkward quickly, mainly due to my inability to take a hint, be even marginally aware of my surroundings, or have any grace whatsoever when it comes to the verbal ballet necessary when emotions are involved. July 21st, 2011 I am in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Sault Ste. Marie. It's the tippity top of America and a stone's throw from the Canadian border. I am performing at a casino, which is always a crapshoot. When people go out to gamble, a comedy show isn't always on their radar. Even worse is there is fierce competition that evening. Ario Speedwagon is playing in the main theater, making me realize I went my whole life without knowing that northern Michigan is where rock goes to die. I am on the phone with my wife, wondering aloud if anyone is even going to show up for comedy given the competition, and she responds with, just give them a good show. You never know who will be in the audience. I smile and tell her that no matter what happens, I'm okay with it. Hell, the night before, only 14 people showed up, but they were 14 attentive, laughter-filled folks who were there to have a good time. Truth be told, I'd much rather have an audience of 14 happy people than 200 pissed off ones. As it turns out, the casino has scheduled the two events back to back. Comedy is to begin just after the dying echo of Keep On Loving You fades into the summer air. Somewhere in the hotel, I picture a clever manager giving himself a shoulder chuck a la Anthony Michael Hall in The Breakfast Club. That manager deserves one because he knew what he was doing. A healthy throng of people migrates directly from the theater to the bar, and as my opening act goes up, it is standing room only. The crowd is drinking, relaxing, and most importantly, laughing. Soon, it is my turn upon the stage, and it's just one of those nights. Everything works, everything hits, laughter, applause, more laughter, more applause. When I hit my contracted time, I am tempted to linger and extend the show. I admit my ego is weak and screams for more attention on nights like this. I consider basking in the sun of my personal Sally Field moment a bit longer. I've got the material, I could fire off stories for over 90 minutes if I wanted, but I decide against doing so. In the back of my mind is the nagging little fact that many casinos don't like shows to run long. Every minute a person isn't on the gaming floor is, well, another minute they're not on the gaming floor. The logic behind that should be beyond self-evident to even the most oblivious window licker. Add to that, as much fun as I am having, the major drawback to the world of slot machines and poker bluffs is you can still consume cigarettes within their walls. At least, you could in 2011. Plumes of blue-gray smoke have been exhaled forth all evening, and over the course of the previous hour, I've bathed in the haze of it. I can feel the smoke infesting my pores and laying cancerous eggs, and I want a shower more than anything else. Fuck it, I decide. Better to leave them wanting more than to give them too much. With a goodnight wave, I leave the stage. I stand behind the table I've set my wares upon, and happily enough, folks are coming by with cash in hand. They're a little intoxicated, they've laughed, it's a perfect combination for me to help them part with a portion of their paycheck. I begin singing the Banana Split song to myself, because, for some reason, my brain registers each sale as a fruit. One banana, two banana, three banana, four. Each banana, one of my t-shirts, walking out the door. Customers come, customers go, smiles, handshakes, transactions. This is repeated until only one woman remains. 
She has been waiting patiently at the back of the line, and I turn to acknowledge her. Hi, I smile as I ask, did you have fun tonight? Yes, she responds in a sad tone, giving me pause. She extends her left hand. I quickly realize my phone is in my right hand, so I set it down and offer a proper greeting her way. She shakes my right hand, but leaves her left hand forward. As I am an idiot, I now take both of her hands in mine and shake them heartily. In my mind, I am imagining Buster Keaton or Groucho Marx. This is exactly what they would do in such a situation. I'm being playful, thinking it's somehow appropriate to the situation. After a moment, I return her appendages to her, and she looks at me slightly frustrated. No, she begins, and offers her left hand yet again. Within a span of seconds, I say the word, oh, twice. First, an upbeat, oh, I get it now, you're offering me your left hand for a reason, exits my mouth. Almost immediately following that, I give an, oh, of realization. It is the release of air, one combined with a sinking feeling and often accompanied by the words, shit, or my god. On her wrist is a small, black, metallic band. Etched upon it is a name, a name and a date, a soldier. On stage, I am vocal in my support for the men and women of the United States military. No matter anyone's feelings on war, government, or any political affiliations, behind the uniform is a person, a mother, father, wife, or in the case of this woman, husband. My embarrassed eyes look away too quickly to remember the name, but I believe the year this woman lost her partner was 2009. She begins thanking me for my tours overseas, telling me how much it means to her that soldiers are remembered and supported. That humans are selfish is no secret. I was in Iraq in 2009. As she speaks, I think back to my time there and wonder if, against all odds, I had stumbled across the man. I have shaken thousands of hands while on military bases. Was his one of them? The most difficult part of any war zone comedy tour is honoring gratitude. I have had shows canceled due to incoming mortars. I have flown over mountaintops in open door helicopters, the air so frigid I began to turn numb. I have waited countless hours in airports and on planes, done shows in awkward, improvised locations, and slept in the worst of beds with the most stinky of sleeping bags. It's what I sign up for and is to be expected. But when a man or woman whose life is on the line every single day, who has been stationed far from home for months or years, when they take hold of my hand, look me dead in the eye and thank me for my little dog and pony show, that's where I stumble. I do my best to listen to the woman reminding me how important it is to the men and women serving that they are remembered, but I am torn. I understand that I have to respect her words, but part of me wants to scream at the top of my lungs, don't thank me, I do nothing, I fly in, strut and fret my hour upon the stage and am heard no more. You have suffered, you have sacrificed, do not thank me. I remain silent and feel guilty for feeling guilty. Maybe she has been drinking, maybe she is truly overcome with emotions too troubling to hold in, but soon she is reduced to a refrain of, thank you, your words about supporting our troops meant so much, thank you, I, I just want to say thank you, thank you. A large part of me wants to give her a hug, to draw her in tightly as if my embrace could somehow give her a moment's respite from the pain. I refrain because I don't know this woman, and it would be unfair of me to impose my will upon her in response to the current situation. I do not invade her personal space, and in the end, all I can do is place a free CD in her hands, telling her the material she enjoyed 
is on the disc. She leaves me by backing away, repeating over and over how much my words meant. Her eyes are watery, but no actual tears flow. You never know who will be in your audience. If you'd like to read more stories of my time overseas, several can be found in a book called I Was a White Knight Once. It is available on Amazon, which I will link to in both the description and a pinned comment. If you'd like to learn more about me, my website is nathantimmel.com. Thanks for listening.